Send the show. Look, I can get this stuff that up. Strutty, we're all right. Hey, are you going to use video in your? Yes, yes, we will. Okay, we'll so this video. will actually be. This will be used. used. This will be used. Right. Exactly. It's okay if my dog walks around. That's background. fine. Bring him All in. Right. Give him a pat. Cool. <laughs> All, right. All right. Let's do that again. Counting All in right. three, two, one. Today in the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with Richard Smith. Richard is the founder of Risk Smith. When he's with his background in mathematical theories of uncertainty, combined with his own personal investing and trading experience, Richard has an acute sense of the critical role that risk and money management play in successfully navigating financial markets. Richard is passionate about leveling the playing field for the individual investor. And today we're going to talk a lot about risk and the philosophies around risk and how do you make the right decisions when you go into an investment. I'm really excited and pumped to have him on the show today to share his incredible knowledge with us, but enough of me. Let's get him out here. G'day, Richard. Welcome to the show. Great to be here, Reed. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to spending a little time together with you and your audience. Mate, it's a real pleasure to having you on the show. Something that we don't talk a lot about, um, which is uh, around the philosophy of, of risk and how it scares us and reptilian brains and all that sort of good stuff. Yeah. We'll get into that in a little bit. But before yeah. we do, let's rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid. Oh, oh my. I started young. Uh, I had a paper route. <laughs> so I think I was 10 years old. I started working when I was 10 years old <laughs> and I haven't stopped since. I had a paper route. Um, I started working at a uh, Baskin Robbins, you know, uh, there in Los Angeles, grocery stores. And, and I actually did some acting. Hmm. Interesting. So I was on a McDonald's commercial yeah, right. and an episode of Lou Grant. <laughs> uh, my sister went on to a bona fide career in, uh, in acting there in L.A., but uh, I got out of the business when I was about 14, but I had enough money to buy my first computer and, uh, and a used car. Awesome. So, awesome. Well, <laughs> so sounds like you, I've been you, at it for a long time. <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds like you've got a healthy relationship with, with earning money and, and it's great to see. The, the, yeah. the question is really designed to see how you're brought up, right? Love is your yeah. family. It wanted to empower you to go out and earn your own dosh and, and make your own way in yeah. life. So Yeah. Well, so, then so, I ended up going to Berkeley for yes. college and that kind of set me back i would say <laughs> <laughs> in terms of appreciating business you know <laughs> right right and right. uh that was quite a quite a wild ride yeah well, but, um, well let's talk about it now i'm back yeah well let's let's talk about <laughs> the the journey because that's the whole point yeah. of what this show is about it's about the journey yeah. of you coming through as as an entrepreneur as yeah. a thought leader um yeah. so maybe walk us through that you know the last 20 or 30 years pro, you know and how you came to what you're doing today. Yeah. Well, so I studied math at, uh, at Berkeley. And then I went on to get a PhD in a field called systems science. And system science is uh, kind of a blend of mathematics and computers and heuristics. A lot of kind of the... Uh, Search engine algorithms, you know, that are so powerful today kind of came out of that field with genetic algorithms, neural networks, fuzzy logic, et cetera. All these ways of kind of using computers to model the way we think and the way we make decisions, you know, kind of model uncertainty, right? So, um, so that's what I did my dissertation on was uh, how scientists and researchers can be more honest about the uncertainty in their models and not put false information into their models that wasn't warranted. Okay. So, um, I was basically developing new mathematics to help people kind of distinguish better between what was really signal and what was just noise. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, it's 1999 and what's happening in 1999, the internet, is coming on right the, stock the, market the dot, is booming the dot boom. and uh, the dot boom is going <laughs> on right so i get my life savings which thankfully didn't amount to much at the time uh get involved in the market and in like 12 months i've run my account up 300 percent. wow so i'm like patting myself on the back right i'm saying man this phd is really paying off <laughs> and uh i'm about to get married and i'm gonna tell the in-laws hey don't worry i got the I got the wedding expenses covered, you know, I'm a real man. Mm -hmm. And uh, then March of 2000 hit. And, 
it only took about 30 days to give back those 300% gains <laughs> instead of the you know, 12 to 18 months it took me to accumulate them. And moreover, it was just a very shocking, jarring experience for somebody who you know, regarded themselves as being semi-literate financially and numerically, right? <laughs> and and a uh, you know, up and coming expert in risk. And I was like a deer in the headlights. You know, it was like, what do I do? And and I remember saying, oh, well, you know, so I had ten thousand dollars and I ran it up to forty thousand dollars. And then it was like down to thirty five thousand dollars. And I said, well, you know, let's not get greedy here. If it gets back to thirty seven thousand dollars, I'll sell. You know, and then we'd get back to $37,000 and I'd say, well, you know, it could get back to $40,000. Why couldn't it go to new highs? You know, and, and you're just lying to yourself. Here's something to help people out there feel better who are intelligent, have high IQs and have lost money. <laughs> um, you, uh, part of the reason that you lose money if you have a high IQ is because you're better at making up stories to justify your essentially emotional decisions, okay? You're good at telling stories. You're good at making up narratives to kind of explain what amount to kind of gut instinct emotional decisions. So that was very shocking to me and, um, and also very intriguing to me, right? Um, and the financial markets are a uh, really wonderful environment for anybody who loves data and loves computing and loves problem solving, you know, it's a, it's a very rich environment for you to test out and validate your theories. <laughs> so that kind of set me off on a journey and, um, and figuring out how I could take this idea of kind of quantifying uncertainty and helping investors do that instead of um, scientists and researchers, because I didn't really like academia that much. Um, I found it kind of a little too pretentious and uh, I liked the street. So, um, so I got involved in, in developing algorithms for myself and then eventually I started a business, a website, actually one of the first FinTech websites called tradestops.com, T-R-A-D-E-S-T-O-P-S, still out there today. I recently uh, sold my interest in the business, but it's a great service. And um, it started out tracking trailing stop loss alerts on stocks, okay? Mm -hmm. So you buy a stock at $100, you're going to use a 25% trailing stop. That means if the stock just goes straight down from there, which I found sometimes that happens, <laughs> uh, and it hits $75, you're going to sell, right? Mm -hmm. But if it starts going higher, you're always having your protective stop. 25% below your highest point of profit. Got it. Okay. Got it. So you are, you have a mechanism for getting out if it doesn't work, right? But you're also kind of locking in your gains as they accumulate, right? Which so, is really powerful. <clears throat> it's very powerful. And what I discovered was why it was so powerful. And the reason I kind of got onto protective stops in the first place was because I took my own portfolio right? What I had gone through in 1999 and 2000. And I said, okay, let's say I just bought the exact same stocks, the exact same amount of money at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. And then I sold them strictly based on a 25% stop loss strategy. Okay. Take all the stress out, Reed, mm -hmm. you know, no worries, right? Just buy it, wait till your stop fly. loss gets hit and exit. Right. So I would have gotten out with $25,000 instead of giving back all my profits. Mm. And then I started testing it on literally dozens and then hundreds of other people's real decisions. And I found that, you know, m way more than half the time, it would improve people's returns, you know, like 50 to 100%, okay? So I said, what's going on here, right? First of all, I gotta get this service out there and let people use it, right? But but what's going on here? So that's when I connected it to the Nobel Prize winning research. Not my Nobel Prize, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Daniel Kahneman. Have you heard of him? Thinking I Fast have. and Slow yes. is his popular yep. book, right? But he goes way back, you know, Kahneman and Tversky. 
I studied them in graduate school in my system science program, right? Uh, you know, they uh, basically developed the field of behavioral finance, behavioral economics, right? Their work was popularized by Michael Lewis in Moneyball and, uh, you know, ultimately made into a movie with Brad Pitt. Michael Lewis wrote another book called The Undoing Project, which was really, you know, more explicitly about their work. And, you know, basically what they said was, hey, you know, this idea of sort of the uh, rational man, rational decision maker out there really doesn't hold up under scrutiny, you know, <laughs> and especially when you got money on the table. Right. Uh, we are, or as Dan Ariely put it in his book, we're predictably irrational. Right. Yes. So um, bear with me here. The meat of the matter in terms of Kahneman's Nobel Prize and then more recently Richard Thaler who was Kahneman's student and he's at MIT now and uh, he wrote Misbehaving, another great book, um, is that we hate to lose. Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no one likes losing. So, no one likes losing. But the, the rub is that the fact that we hate to lose has different consequences for when we're losing on an investment Mm. or when we're winning on an investment. When you are losing on an investment, the fact that you hate to lose makes you not want to sell. Right. Because you don't want to take the loss. So what do you do? Double down, triple down, say, well, this was a short-term trade, but now it's a long-term investment. <laughs> uh, you know, one of my favorites was, believe it or not, this guy, one of my customers, he was a explosives engineer at Lawrence Livermore Labs in Berkeley. And he made the explosives that went on the um, oil rig platforms out in the Gulf of Mexico. These explosives sever the rig from their moorings if there's a crisis. So they have to work when they need to work and, and they have to only work once, right? And they have right. to be very high reliability. But he had bought this stock that supposedly was going to mine gold on the ocean floor. Nautilus Minerals. You're out there, buddy. Sorry about telling this story. I won't give any names. <laughs> but, um, you know, the stock had become a penny stock. And he said, yep, I know it's going to come back, though. I'm going to give it to my grandkids. <laughs> so I thought that was still, to this day, the ultimate denial the ultimate loss aversion, right? Right. Yeah, the, the stock didn't work out, but hey, my grandkids are going to benefit from it, even though I didn't. I know I'm going to be right eventually. That's what it boils down to, you know? We don't want to be wrong. We don't want the embarrassment of being wrong. So when we're losing, we are risk-seeking. We take on more risk. We double down. We put more money into the position, right? Um, we hold on. We, and then Richard Thaler got his Nobel Prize for adding the fact that we always want to get back to break even. Mm. So I used to say, when I was out speaking to a lot of audiences, anytime you hear yourself say to yourself in your head about an investment, well, I'm going to get out when it gets back to break even. <laughs> <laughs> you know you are in trouble. You're toast. You know, get out because it's not going to get back to break even. And even if it does get back to break even, you're probably lying to yourself and you're not going to sell it then. So, right. so anyway, when we're losing, we are risk seeking. Okay. And feel free to stop me if, yeah, I'm, no, no, this is, this is, if you're losing any of this. No, no, I think right. the, I'll, I'll, I will just jump in with, um, yeah. with a couple of things here because okay. I think what you've, what you've highlighted to, to this point is really uh, an innate sense in all of us that we all know exists, right? Yeah. We do subconsciously we do, yes. uh, but for trying to, understand it and lay it out for us so we can be better investors rather yeah. than just the algorithms that you're now putting yeah. in place, which are really powerful because it takes all the emotion out of it and know that yeah. the stock drops 25%, boom, you're yeah. gone. It's you sold. Yeah. Yeah. So well, we'll, we'll get to emotion. Here. Sure. Okay. But, uh, okay. Keep going then. Keep going. <laughs> but let me keep going here. So I've talked about what um, loss aversion does when we're underwater on a position. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now let's think about 
what it does when we're winning, when we're ahead on a position. What our fear of loss attaches itself to are our profits. Right. So we become risk averse when we're winning. We want to sell. A stock gets up 100%, it becomes almost intolerable to hold on to it at that point. You know, I, is, isn't that true? Right, yeah. You think, you think this is too good to be true and I don't Too wanna, good to be true, you know, it happened up. in three months. I just, <laughs> I, I'm going to make a confession. So I bought Tesla at uh, $450, you know, wow. back in March, right? thought, oh my God, this is my chance to get into Tesla. Musk is a stud. <laughs> and uh, if you see him in LA, say hello. <laughs> so um, then, uh, you know, and, and then it, it went up like 100% in, in like 60 days, right? And it's not crazy to take some profits <laughs> at mm -hmm. that point, but it became hard not to sell it, right? And um, so I sold half of my position just to relieve the pressure. And sure enough, where's Tesla today? It's over a thousand bucks, right? So if I had done nothing, you know, I would have been up more, right? So, so we're risk averse when we're winning and we're risk seeking when we're losing, okay? Mm -hmm. So I don't have evidence to prove this, but my experience and my gut tells me that this loss aversion that we all have is responsible for half or more of the chronic underperformance of the individual investor when it comes to investing. Okay, I think it's that serious. It is in every decision we make, you know? And if you start to watch this in yourself, you will see it over and over and over again. You know, you, you get into a position where you're in the hole, and you say, well, I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to double down. I'm going to lower my cost average, whatever. You know, I'm going to get back to break even. And then when you get ahead, you're like, oh, God, I'm up 100%. I got, I got to get out of here. And so psychologically, we have a mechanism for disaster. Like we can dig a hole deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Right? We can go to zero. And it happens all the time right? Do you know if you have a 90% loss, what kind of gain you have to have to recover from that? It's 110, right? Because you, it's no, always... no, it's 1,000, Reed. It's 1,000. It's 1,000. You have to have a 10 bagger to right. recover from a 90% loss. Right. Yes, yes, yes. It's a yes, thousand yes. percent. So, um, you know, those are tough numbers. People have 90% losses all the time, but very few people have 1,000% gains, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew enough math to go, what's wrong with this, right? Like, how come I'm not having 1,000% gains and I'm having 90% losses? And it's because of this bias that we have. It's because, you know, we have this mechanism. We're risk-seeking when we're losing and we're risk-averse when we're winning. And so you regularly can have 80, 90 total losses. You know, I, I used to have one stock on my, in my brokerage account that I couldn't get rid of the thing, right? It had gone to zero. I couldn't even sell it for a penny and it would sit there and mock me <laughs> for years <laughs> until I finally closed down the brokerage account, right? So I connected that to, you know, uh, Kahneman and Thaler and prospect theory. And I started to see how even the humble uh, trailing stop makes you risk averse when you're losing and risk seeking when you're winning, right? That's what the data showed me. And so that was great. Um, you know, to me, the magic of investing, successful investing, I should say, happens um, when you start to do something that works, you know, and you do it consistently and you stick to it. Mm. And it becomes like a discipline, right? So one of my personal heroes in the investing space is a guy named Cliff Asnes. He founded uh, Advanced Quantitative Research, AQR, who's kind of one of the original quants. Um, by the way, so he got his PhD 
at the University of Chicago under one of the efficient market hypothesis guys, maybe Eugene Fama. Got to get that. Got to figure out if I'm saying that right or not. But he proved to the efficient market hypothesis guy that momentum was an inefficiency in the markets. Momentum exists in the markets. It's the only thing that the academics and the technicians agree on. <laughs> momentum exists in the markets, which when you couple momentum with our um, loss aversion, you can see how we really get ourselves into trouble, right? So there's a famous quote from John Maynard Keynes that says the markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. <laughs> I like okay? it. I like it. So what that's saying is sometimes the markets go nuts, right? Sometimes COVID-19 hits. Sometimes, you know, the mortgage crisis hits. Sometimes the dot bust hits. But other times the dot boom hits. Mm -hmm. Other times you have a rally from March 2009 all the way up to, you know, February 2020, right? right? Who knew in March of 2009, you know, when the S&P 500 hit 666 or whatever it hit, you know, that it was going to just basically go up uninterrupted, you know, for the next 10 years, right? That's not what right. anybody was thinking at the time. So markets... Um, defy logic, right? And so our logic of, you know, wanting to hold on to our losers and sell our winners makes us suffer from mm -hmm. when the markets defy logic. So I say, you know, how do we have our profits defy our logic? Logic defying profits logic. instead of logic defying losses. That's what I'm in it for. Right. So how do we... At it today, you, you, you've painted a very incredible picture. And I think something that we, again, goes back to the, we all, we, we, know, we all know this within ourselves. We all make stupid mistakes. We look back and, oh, gosh, I should have done X, Y, Z. Yeah. yeah. How do we self-assess today to make sure that we understand what it is that, who we are as a human beings individually to know that how are we going to react in those times of uncertainty in the times of the dot bust or in the times of the dot boom or in the 10 years of rallying since 2008, how do we make sure we know in ourselves that well, what are we, what, what type of investor am I? <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'm working on that. <laughs> I don't have all the answers yet. Um, I've got some ideas, you know, and I've definitely, um, I've developed tools and algorithms um, I'm developing new software right now that, that I hope will address that very question. You know, I'm a big believer in the behavior shaping power of technology and in the opportunity to leverage technology to help us learn new behaviors, new habits, okay? And to be, and to be more self-aware of our current habits, okay? So that's what I'm working on. So I'm, I'm building it and um, I'm excited about it. But, but has to, <clears throat> go ahead. I, I like to use an analogy of learning to fly a plane with learning to invest. The way that people approach investing, it's sort of like, they want to learn to fly a plane and they think they can just walk out to the runway, hop in the cockpit, pull back on the stick, take off and not die. But that's not how it works. Nobody would think that when it comes to flying a plane, right? But that is what we think when it comes to investing. Somehow we can just jump in here. We don't have to take the time, not a ton of time, but some time to educate ourselves, to learn a little bit about history, okay? to um, maybe play around with a little bit of money instead of all of our money. <laughs> you know, one of my early mentors, I said to him, uh, his name is Jake Bernstein. I said, Jake, what's the difference between the winners and the losers? And he said, the winners don't need the money. And at first I thought, hmm. Okay, so the rich keep getting richer and the rest of us keep getting the shaft. But over time, I came to realize what it actually means is that you can't put yourself 
in positions of undue stress, mm -hmm. right? You can't have more on the table. You can't have more at risk than you can afford to lose, okay? So I use volatility and I do something that it's called volatility budgeting. You budget for volatility, right? So um, I developed this indicator, one of the first indicators I developed, um, it's called the volatility quotient. And it's just a number of percent, okay? Like on Microsoft and, well, let's see, on Walmart and Johnson and Johnson, it might be like 12 to 13% on Microsoft and Apple, 18%, Tesla, Twitter, 35%, um, you know, junior gold mining stocks and biotech startups, 95%. And what the number is designed to tell you is how much noise there's likely to be in this investment, how much volatility you need to endure if you want to hold that stock for at least 12 to 18 months. Hmm. Okay. So if you have a sense of that, right, you have a sense, even that, you know, hey, Tesla is three times as volatile as Walmart, right? I, yep. That's very helpful, right? That's called volatility budgeting, okay? So now you can decide, for example, how much are you willing to um, put in that investment, okay? So let's take two simple scenarios. One is a stock that has a 10% volatility quotient, okay? And one is a stock that has a 50% volatility quotient. And you say, I'm willing to risk $1,000 on each of these stocks. How much can I invest? So on the 10% stock, you can invest $10,000. And if your $10,000 investment falls 10%, you're down 1,000 mm bucks, -hmm. okay? But on the 50% stock, you can only invest $2,000. And if your $2,000 investment falls 50%, you're down a thousand bucks, okay? So in the hedge fund world, they call this risk parity. Mm -hmm. I call it equal risk. And it's just a very powerful way of um, doing volatility budgeting, right? So you're actually budgeting for the volatility and volatility is a proxy for risk. Um, Instead of just kind of thinking, well, I'll just put an equal amount of money into these two investments. And see what happens. So that I found that to be very powerful. I found it to be psychologically very helpful to people, you know, because your puke point is actually a combination of the amount of money that you invest and the volatility of the investment. Hmm. With, with, with that, how do you yeah. calculate the, the volatility number on, on a certain stock? Because that, that is super interesting. And I think that's a very powerful example of how yeah. people can assess the two of them because that will then, you, if you knew that number going in before you bought Tesla or before yeah. you bought whatever you're going to buy, you will have a different, your, your, your subconscious will tell you, well, hang on, hang on, well, that, that's 50%. That's a lot. The other one's only 10. Like, let's, let's, let's pump the brakes here a little bit and think about what I'm doing. And I guess yeah. that pumping the brakes is all you're trying to do to yep. think twice about something before making an investment decision. Is that what, that's the whole point of the volatility number, right? That's a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's kind of understanding better what you're walking into, mm -hmm. right? What you're going to have to put up with, what you're going to have to stomach. And um, that's, it's all about expectations. You know, I read a quote, you know, something about uh, risk is the difference between an outcome and your expectations. Right. And so having accurate expectations is half the battle, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, if you get into Tesla, you know, and you think that, you know, and it's a thousand bucks today, right? You think, well, I'm going to buy it, you know, and, and of course it's going to keep going up because, hey, it's on a rocket ship. <laughs> and Musk just literally put some guys in space, man, and landed right. the, the drone on a 
I mean, landed the booster rocket on a drone in the middle of the ocean. This guy can do anything. <laughs> it was awesome. That was awesome. Uh, and you're not prepared for Tesla to fall by 50% in the next 12 months. You know, you should not be in that stock, right? right because right. you're going to throw in the towel at the exact wrong time. You know, you are, as uh, my friend Stan Ehrlich says, you should be uh, selling into rallies and buying into dips. Right. But instead, everybody buys into rallies and sells into dips. And, right? and that, that brings up an interesting point of how the stock market just today with COVID, you brought up COVID yeah. earlier. Yeah. What's your two cents on that? Like, you, you, you're seeing that a lot of people are, are thinking that in the next 12 to 18 months, we're, we're going to recover very quickly and hence why the stock market is above what it was before COVID. Like, it's some pretty, some pretty no. crazy. It, it, what, what, what do you, what do you, <laughs> so, what is, what's, what's your sort of tea leaves saying about that with how well the stock market has come through, well, not come through, not through COVID, but is, is faring through COVID? I think it's a couple of things. The biggest one is the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard the saying, don't fight the Fed? Yep. So they've put um, unprecedented liquidity into the economy. And that is what is driving up the prices. Now, couple that with the fact that the, um, with COVID, uh, in my opinion, the cure was worse than the disease. And the, um, you know, there was tremendous panic. Yep. That was fueled rather uh, um, gleefully, I would say. <laughs> uh, That's all right. Excuse me, just a moment. That's all right. <laughs> Okay, Bertie. So I, I do think that the reaction was afternoon delivery person. That's all right. Thank meat you. dog. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Bertie. That's good. You scared him off. Um, so I think that the reaction was overdone. I think the recovery is going to be stronger than what people expected. And I think that coupled with the liquidity boost that the Fed gave. Plus, we're in, um, I'm not sure if you've heard about the presidential cycle yes. pattern, but yes. uh, you know, we're coming up on an election and Donald Trump uh, really um, is betting the farm on you know, good, a good economy mm -hmm. and, uh, and a good stock market and he identifies with the stock market and um, so yeah, so I think all those things are sort of, uh, um, making the stock market, you know, probably disconnect a bit from the economic reality, but that's what stock markets do. You know, they're anticipatory systems. So what I mean by that is everybody in the market is trying to out anticipate everybody else. Okay. Right. So, you know. You're trying to predict what most people are going to do and then make money off of what you think everybody's going to do, right? <laughs> so, um, yes, there are fundamental, you know, economic underlying drivers of the markets like liquidity. Um, but, but ultimately, they are, and this goes back to my system science days, they are anticipatory systems. So, in anticipatory systems, you get feedback loops. And, you know, those feedback loops can sometimes, like when you bring two microphones too close together, right? You're like, ah! Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that happens in markets and they, you know, they sometimes disconnect, um, you know, very tough predicting when those disconnections are going to come back to earth. Right. Um, but... Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's very, it's, no, very, very interesting. And um, I guess that the, the question for you is what practical yeah. steps can investors take today yeah. in order to self-assess yep. and be more knowledgeable and all those good things before yep. jumping headfirst into any new investment coming, coming in 2020 or 2021? Yep. So I think um, 
for one thing, you kind of have to know where you're at as an investor, right? So if you're just getting started, you don't know what you're doing. I don't care how smart you are, how accomplished you are in other areas of your life. It will not apply to the stock market. The stock market and investing is uh, bass backwards. okay? You end up having to do the opposite of everything that your instincts tell you to do, you know? Um, I remember, you know, a year or two into learning about investing and I was learning the hard way, right? Um, it was like, man, if I had just done the exact opposite of everything, <laughs> I, every decision I ever made, I'd be wealthy. <laughs> What's going on here? And that's literally how it works, you know, because it's an anticipatory system. <laughs> um, because, you know, there are second and third order anticipations of what, you know, everybody else is going to be doing. That, that's just kind of how it works. That's how the markets are set up. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have to be able to be honest with yourself about where you're at as an investor. Are you just starting out? Are you a year or two into this? Are you, you know two to five years into this, five to 10 years into this, 10 to 20 years into this, you know, like it takes time. So don't be afraid to kind of admit where you're at. Don't be afraid to ask for help. <laughs> don't be afraid to, um, you know, find a couple of great books and just read them and, you know, and, but you do have to put a little bit of money in the markets and, um, and learn by doing, you know, like, I'm not a believer in paper trading. You can learn a little bit from paper trading, but you don't make the same decisions paper trading as you do when you have your own money on the table, right? Right. So um, in terms of volatility budgeting, um, there's, an, there's, a, uh, there's an indicator called beta, which is available on most all financial websites on any company. You go to Yahoo Finance, you can look at the beta of a stock and it'll give you an idea of the relative volatility of that stock to the s p 500 so you can get an idea you know if it's like a one it's probably about as volatile as the s p 500 if it's a two it's probably twice as volatile mm -hmm. so right there that'll help you do a little bit of volatility budgeting right and put more money into the stocks that are less volatile and less money into the stocks that are more volatile i'm a big believer that you should have volatile stocks in your portfolio right? You should have volatility in there. It's like meat and potatoes are kind of your low volatility stocks, but you want, you know, salt and pepper, maybe even some, you know, uh, maybe even some sriracha or some cayenne, you know, I love hot sauce. And, and they can actually be incredibly beneficial to even a conservative portfolio. Mm. They really can, because ultimately you want a portfolio of assets that are not all going up and down at the same time together. Okay. Right. So you want to minimize the correlation of the assets in your portfolio. Ray Dalio, you know, Ray Dalio, everybody mm -hmm. knows who Ray Dalio is. He said the holy grail of investing is 15 good uncorrelated investment ideas. Okay. So they all are benefiting from the upward momentum overall of the market, but they're minimally correlated to each other. Right. So you can actually lower the volatility of even a conservative portfolio sometimes by putting in a volatile stock that's negatively correlated to the other holdings in your portfolio. You can lower your volatility. So you want to, overall, you want to kind of maximize the volatility of the individual stocks while minimizing the volatility of your overall portfolio. You want to stop taking gains and losses personally on individual stocks, okay? I say, you know, a pilot would never take the weather personally. Don't take, you know, a loss on an individual stock personally as though it was a personal failure, okay? It wasn't, you know? You didn't know that COVID-19 was going to hit, you know? That's not personal. And, um, and so, you know, a pilot who's going to fly from point A to point B is going to expect turbulence, is going to hit air pockets, Right not going to expect to take off and have a completely smooth flight, you know, nary a cloud in the sky and land at your destination and just go, ah, it's perfect. It doesn't work that way, you know? So don't take things personally. Understand 
a little bit about probability and expected value and volatility, use some algorithms, but also, you know, own it. Mm. You got to be, if you're going to be in the game, you got to own it. You know, it's nobody else's decision. It's yours. Love it. And uh, I think that's what, you know, a lot of people miss. Yeah. And uh, markets aren't just a game, you know, like it's a, it's capital allocation. It's actually a values based activity. If you, if you let it be. Right. You can express your values <laughs> in the marketplace. <laughs> well, Richard, I think that's been insightful in terms of how much you've unpacked upon us today in terms okay. of the, the different, okay. the, the, the ways in which to look within oneself to understand that we do all have these flaws within each other yeah. and how we can mitigate those flaws. And just having yeah. certain like the volatility index, I think that's a bloody great thing that yep. people should be looking at if you're yeah. inter- investing in stocks. And also, if you can try and- and they're not even flaws, okay? They're just flaws when it comes to the stock market. (laughs) (laughs) Because as you said before, you know, the the higher the IQ, the better the story you can make up, right? Yeah, absolutely. Which is, I think that's a a great one because- And you take your own story seriously. You do, you do. (laughs) The the, the chatter inside the head, the the BS that you keep telling yourself, it's going to be fine when I get back to neutral and I'm going to sell it, you know? I'm going to sell it. Exactly. 45 grand? No, we'll we'll wait till it gets to 47, you know? That's right. Oh, I love it. Well, mate, yeah. look, at the end of every show, we like to do the top five investing tips. You ready to get into it? All right. Mate, what is a daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? Uh, I get up in the morning and before everybody else gets up and I just spend a little time thinking about my goals and uh, um, making sure I'm clear about what the day ahead is going to be about uh, before the day gets a hold of me. Mm, Love it. Just having a little bit of quiet time. I think that's really important. Absolutely. Question number two, who is the most influential person in your career to date? A man named Albert Luongo. And uh, I met Albert probably 25 years ago. And kind of old school Italian guy. And uh, he... um, yeah, he's been just a real mentor to me. He got me into being an entrepreneur. You know, I probably would have ended up going down more of an academic bent, but he's opened up 30 plus restaurants in his life and nightclubs and uh, just done all kinds of amazing things. Yet he's a very wise and spiritual person. And, um, and he really taught me, you know, what, what, what he called and what I've come to see is the romance of business. And uh, it's fun. You know, like I said, I went to Berkeley and I've kind of, I had to recover from that. (laughs) Because I was out there in uh, the anti-apartheid rallies, you know, in in the mid 80s, late 80s. And, um, you know, business gets a bad rap, but it's an incredible pursuit. You know, it's so creative and it is adventurous and even romantic. And uh, very grateful to Albert for helping open my eyes to that. That's, that's very poetic. I think uh, <laughs> b- b- business is a romance. I think that's ex- very, very true. And you have to understand yeah. that as it evolves uh, over time. Another one that I'll just share with you quickly sure. of what he said was, a good company should be good company. <laughs> yeah enjoy the people you do business with it's like absolutely it, it, life is short you don't you're not being put on this earth to yeah. do people do business with excuse my language dickheads you know i've got this <laughs> saying that you know I, i'm pretty good at being after traveling the world quickly assessing whether i'm going to have a beer with someone or not um, yeah. just backpacking i've done a lot of backpacking and, and you uh-huh. get really quickly at, at going within the first 30 seconds first 30 seconds come out words yeah. come out of your mouth I'm going to determine yep. I'm going to have a beer with you or not. If I can't, see yep. you later. I'm going to the next bar. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. how you've got to have a, bit, a little bit with <laughs> yeah. your, with, with business. You know, if yep. you can't have a beer I, with someone, I totally agree. Come with a pound sand. Yep. <laughs> Question number three: In your business today, what yep. is the number one or the most influential tool that you use on a daily on a daily basis? And when I say tool, it could be a physical tool like your phone or a computer or a journal. Or, or it could be an actual piece of technology that you use day in, day out that you can't, you can't you know, run the business without. Um, I mean, I spend a lot of time in front of my computer, for sure. Um, 
you know, I've learned a lot about business in 20 years now. Um, and uh, it kind of goes back to your first question about goals. And I've thought a lot about this because, you know, I'm really at heart kind of a mission-based person. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you know, you do, if you are in business, you have to have a profit another Albertism. He said, the definition of business is it's what you go out of when you don't have enough of it. So really grappling with those things, you know, and making sure that you have the right metrics to drive your business. So um, for me, that's annual recurring revenue is a big one. Right. And customer acquisition cost, And uh, lifetime value of a customer. So all those things have taken on a lot more significance for me, I think, as I've matured in business. And, um, you know, I think they're important things for all entrepreneurs to really stay focused on. Right. I love it. Love it. Question number four, in one sentence, what has been the biggest failure that you have it's occurred in your life and what'd you learn from that failure? I'd say a failure of communication and um, I failed to communicate to, to always really let people know kind of what was going on with me and where I was having trouble. And uh, I think like failing in that communication damaged some relationships and, and, uh, you know, was, uh, could have been better. Mm. So that's, you know, when you see that kind of makes you sad. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another kind of lesson you learn the hard way that, uh, you know, we're not always perfect. We're not always noble. Um, sometimes we have base desires and uh, sometimes we're screwed up from past experiences and um, traumas, right? And uh, you got to work with people that you trust and that you can talk to and that you can sometimes work through that stuff. So you got to communicate. Yeah, love it. Love it. <laughs> Last question, mate, before we end the show is where can people reach you to continue the conversation and uh, where, where, where will they go? Thank you. Yes. Uh, so you can follow my work at richardmsmith.com. Uh, and then also I have a not-for-profit that I'm the chairman and CEO of called the Foundation for the Study of Cycles. Mm. And you can learn about it at cycles.org, cycles.org. And in fact, we have a week-long free event with some uh, leading financial cycles practitioners, including Jake Bernstein, Larry Williams, Jeffrey Hirsch, Perry Kaufman, uh, Peter Eliades, Bill Sarubi, Stan Ehrlich, myself. Um, and it's going to be two hours a day between June 22nd and 26th of uh, um, the best experts out there on how to use cycles in the financial markets. So people can learn about that at events.cycles.org. You can sign up and uh, definitely check out cycles.org. Learn more about the Foundation for the Study of Cycles. I'm something I'm very passionate about. We didn't get to get into that today, Reed, but maybe another time. Definitely another time, my friend. Well, look, mate, I want to thank you for jumping on the show today. I just want to reflect some of the things that I took away from today's show. I think there was some absolute crackers of one-liners in there. And I <laughs> <Crackers>. think <laughs> I like it. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously in and around the behavioral finance piece of it, I think yeah. it's really important for all of us uh, understanding who we are as human beings in order yep. to make the right decisions. And it sounds like you've done a lot of self-discovery along the way that yeah. has led you back to your finance roots Yep. through understanding, being more self-aware, being more grounded yeah. and comfortable within your own skin. I would even yes. go to say that, Baha, to yep. understand who you are to then go make better investment decisions. And yeah, as woo-woo as, as, as that sounds, it's true, but because- It's not woo-woo at all. <laughs> it's, but you it's know what the I'm facts. Saying? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and, you know, people can't, you can't avoid it. Don't put mm -hmm. it off. 
Right. You know, whatever your path is, you got to dig into it. You know, you have to slow down the monkey mind. Uh, you have to still the, you have to empty the mind. You have to still the body and you have to purify the heart. Exactly. And then that improves everything you do. Right. Right. Well, mate, I want to, again, thank you so much for jumping on today's thank show. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a great, great conversation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week and we'll catch up very, very soon. Excellent. Thanks. Take care, Reed. Well, there you have another cracking episode jam packed with some incredible advice from Richard Smith. Please do check out all the other uh, links that he mentioned on today's show because he is doing some incredible stuff in and around understanding the psychology of investing and trying to make in the average investor be better when it comes to making those massive decisions and not overreacting when you, uh, you're up 100% and uh, <laughs> not panicking when yeah. you're down. So yeah. uh, definitely check out all his stuff. Uh, I want to thank all the listeners for taking some time out of their day to tune in to continue to grow their financial IQ because that's what we do on this show. We do this here nice. week, week out. Uh, like if it. you do like this show, please give back by jumping onto iTunes um, and giving the show a five-star review. I'm going to do this all again next week. So remember, be bold, be brave, and go give life.